Hello, I'm Ed Ribby, also known as the Rabbit Atheist, a former pastor turned atheist, now a compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. Feel free to like or dislike the video as you see fit. Feel free to comment below, and uh, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel and hit your notification bell for more content as is released. Uh, you're also free to share my videos as much as you like, uh, because the purpose of this channel is educational in regards to atheist and deconversion issues, and any related issues related to those issues. Uh, today we're on another journey, another week of Sundays with the Rabbit Atheist, and uh, kind of I'm taking a little bit different approach. I'm just trying to give you something, and uh, that'll be better than going to church on Sunday. And uh, that's probably why I'm going to start dropping these videos when I did at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'll be at work, but you know, it won't be a premiere uh, necessarily, but it'll give you something to, to listen to instead of going to church service and uh, wasting your time there. Some of you are out of that, so you know, going out, uh, you know, heading that direction is definitely a little bit more uh, productive. And so I'm just going to try to give you some things to think about. My tone on Sundays is going to be more try helpful advice, uh, wisdom. Uh, you know, I, I have a great deal of compassion as to, as the, you know, you probably saw the title today. I'm looking at uh, seven deconversion tips, you know, that I've learned through painful experience and going through it and, and being, you know, a person who has deconverted. And I want to talk about uh, some of the things I've learned today and kind of help you out. And that's kind of where I want these Sunday broadcasts to kind of go. I, I, I'm going to do that. And then if there's any other comments or issues that people bring up, I'll be glad to address them here. Um, today I want to talk about seven things, seven deconversion tips, seven things that I've learned going through deconversion that I want to pass on to maybe some of you that are not as far into it as I am, you, you have been. Um, if you know my story, I've been deconverting pretty much since 2015, so it's an eight-year period. Um, in fact, I was just thinking about it the other day. This is I, I haven't been in the pulpit for five years. Uh, in May, at the end of May, was the last, it's been five years, over five years now that since I've been a preacher. And so, um, you know, what happened? How did I get through all this? What have I learned in all this eight years of time deconverting? Um, and, you know, I, I try to encapsulate it today. And I, I got seven things, and I'm going to give you a, another bonus one. Uh, for those of you, uh, there's a bonus one at the end, an eighth one, for those of you that might be in the ministry. Okay, so I want to let you know that. So stay tuned for that. Tip number one, uh, be patient with yourself. Um, deconstruction, deconversion is a, is a big moment. It is a ch complete change in direction. You are not going to solve all the things that your religion mentally causes you to do, all the habits, all the belief systems, all the way you look at life and the universe, that's not going to change overnight. And you have to be patient with yourself. You're going to screw up. Uh, you're going to mess up. Um, you're going to make mistakes when you talk to people about what you're going through. And you need to be patient with yourself because this is a long road. I mean, if you were in Christianity or whatever religion you were in for a long time, your thinking has been processed and pushed and whatever by that religion. And now that you're out of it, it's going to take an equally long time to, to reprocess and re, rewire your head. Um, I, I kind of like it to when somebody who hasn't been eating healthy and they haven't been going to the gym, they used to, but they didn't. And now they want to go back and they're bemoaning the fact that it's taking so long. Well, you know, it took you two years to get out of shape. It's going to take you two, you know, maybe two years to get back where you were. And that's a hard pill for somebody to swallow, but deconversion is kind of a lot the same way. And if you've never, you know, you know, it took you a lifetime to get here, it may take another lifetime to get out. Uh, and I, I don't want to discourage you with that, but learn to be patient with yourself. Number two, learn to be patient with other people, particularly those people that are still in the faith. I, I often... There's a great notable difference between atheists who have always been atheists and atheists who have come out of faith and religion. 
Uh, and that notable difference is usually their level of patience with, with people that are still believers. I, I find myself, I'm very empathic with people that still believe. I still, I think I'm much more tolerant of their beliefs. I know that some atheists, uh, you know, will explain the truth to people and then the people still believe what they believe. And it's like, oh, well, now you're deceiving, you're being deceptive, you're lying. And it's like, no, they genuinely still believe. I remember when I was a believer and people would accuse me of being deceptive. I said, no, I, I think you're wrong. And I think what I believe is right. And you got to remember what it was like to be you when you're dealing with other people that are, you know, family members, friends that are still in the faith or whatever faith it is. You have to remember you were them at one point and you were still this way. And then you come out, well, they, they may be on that journey or maybe not. But you got to be patient with them because you got to realize how easy it is to be deceived by this stuff. Um, you know, I look back at it. I, when I was in the pulpit, I didn't really feel I was being deceptive. I felt I had the truth, and I acted in good intentions. I think very much I was a good person, but you know, they just you're wired up with all this stuff, and you got to remember those people that still believe are wired up with that stuff. Okay, and you got to be patient with them. Um, you need to learn the two sides of deconversion. And this is something I'm struggling with right now because for a long time, I, I understood the detangling, the deconstruction part of deconversion. See, I, I use the term deconversion. A lot of people use the term deconstruction. But I've kind of, to me, the umbrella term is more deconversion. And the first part of deconversion, there's two sides to this coin is detangling yourself, deconstructing yourself from what was. But there's another side, which is reconstructing and rebuilding yourself in what you want you to be, okay? And if you're an atheist who used to believe, this is a hard one because you now have to do the hard work of figuring out what your morals are. You have to figure out what your character is gonna be. You're gonna figure out what exactly is it that you're following. You know, you have to move not just from detangling yourself from the past and the different garbage things and the abuse and other things that go on with that and start looking, okay, how do I, I move to a positive future? I don't think deconversion is ever complete. Okay, I, I'm going to tell you this. That's why I tell you to be patient with yourself because I don't think it's ever going to be complete. I don't think it's ever going to get to a point where you can say, ah, oh, man, I'm still I'm completely unaffected by what I used to be. Now, maybe people that have a shorter time, but I was 40 years a Christian. I was 20 years a minister. And so when I look at this, you know, I, you know, it's kind of why I started my other channel, Simple Life Philosophy, because that channel is more about outside of atheism, what am I trying to be? Okay, I know I'm going to be an atheist. I know I'm going to be the rabid atheist, but what other thing, what other things am I going to be in? That's why I kind of embraced other things like Stoicism and Minimalism and Essentialism and examining those philosophies and starting to embrace them and become something different, okay? Become something different. And that's the other side of deconversion is I've deconstructed the old and got rid of all the nonsense, but I still have these parts that are me, and now i got to fill in those blanks with other things, okay? Um, and... That's why you gotta you gotta kind of you end up going back and forth between those two things. Oh, okay, I've detangled myself from this. What am I gonna do with that hole that's there now? Okay, what is, what's gonna happen there? I gotta think about that. And once you recognize there's two sides to this, that there's not just a negative to get over, but there's a positive to embrace, it really motivates you to do a lot better. Okay, and that's the positive to embrace that you that you really need to cultivate. Uh, number four. Don't make major life decisions while you're still in your angry atheist phase. Um, a lot of people, deconverting is a lot like the grieving process. Uh, your first reaction, man, I, I can't believe that I was duped by this crap, okay? And you just spend all your time just shaking your head about yourself. And then that leads to anger. Like, it, you get really angered. And... During this anger time, and it really depends on the person. Some people, are, it's very short. Some people, it's really long. Don't make any major life decisions, okay? Because you're, you're in a phase right now where your emotions are ginned up, and you're not going to be thinking clearly. Um, 
that, you know, despite the fact that many of us became atheists for very rational reasons, our emotion reaction tends to be disbelief, anger, then kind of a sadness. You know, it, it really is very much like grieving. It's like you lost a friend. It's like you lost somebody that was a major part of your life, this religion, this faith. I mean, especially if you believe like, you know, Jesus Christ was walking with you and your friend and now you've lost your imaginary friend, but to you is a real friend. And so there's this anger and this deep converting, this grieving process over grieving over your religion. And part of that is anger. And during that anger phase, I don't suggest making any life decisions. When I left the faith, I was still in the pulpit and I don't, I don't take this lightly, but I, I was still in the pulpit and... I went through my angry atheist phase while I was still preaching the quote-unquote gospel. And it was hard. It was one of the hardest things. It was incredibly stressful. And, you know, those of you that have watched my story on this channel, my deconversion story, which I'm going to redo here very shortly, uh, get, you know, more details and, and where I am today. But if you watch that story, you need to understand that my, my you know, I realized that Christianity was garbage, and there was no way to save it, okay? It was just, it, there was nothing there, okay? I spent about a year being a deist, saying, well, maybe there's a God, but Christianity ain't it. And then I just came to the conclusion that deism or just believing in God is like, well, it's religion light, okay? It's still made up. It, there's nothing there. And I became an atheist, but I had kind of gone through the disbelief part while being a deist, so I went right into anger, right? God damn, I, I've literally wasted 18 years of my life with this, being a servant of God, being a man of God. And I've, you know, it's been 40 years of being a Christian. And I'm like, I was mad. <laughs> and I was preaching. And I think that year I stayed away from a lot of people. And I just didn't make any major life decisions. Uh, at the time, I really didn't like my marriage. Um, but I, I realized then, don't make any decisions. Now, I'll get to my last tip. When I get to the bonus tip, I'll tell you how I got through that. But just don't make any major life decisions while you're, you're in your angry atheist phase. Uh, um, number five, make sure you're thinking through each issue in life and not just being a reactionary to your former faith. This is one commitment I made very early often because I, I usually watch atheists that leave the church. They go from being conservative Christians and they immediately jump to liberal, whatever, Democrat. And whenever I see that and I watch these people do it, I think, man, you just traded one religion for another. You've just traded religion and politics for religion. And you're just political activists to, to fill the void there. And it's not necessarily that you've thought through those issues either. I'm going to get to that when I, in a little bit in this video when I talk about manipulation and how everybody does it. But... Uh, you need to realize that that's probably not a good time, you know, to, you got to think through every issue. I spent a lot of time thinking through every issue, every social, political issue. Okay, there's no God, there's no Bible telling me what to believe about this. What's the reality? What's the facts? And that's why I'm not on the liberal camp. I'm not in the conservative camp. Um, you know, it really depends on the issue where I stand on things. And I think it's good advice to do that because the temptation is, because what that looks like to me is this is the way I used to be. Now I'm going to fight against everything that that was, that I stood for before. And I don't know, it, it really strikes me as odd, you know, that sometimes we think that the way to fight against what we used to be before is to completely flip and go the opposite direction. So I, I encourage people, don't be angry when you think about these issues, but also Make three, sure you're through, through every issue. Get some facts. Read up on it. You know, make sure that you're just not flip-flopping just because you, you've changed teams, okay? And you'll just trade one type of religious devotion for another. Uh, number six, family is more important than being right. Okay, as much as I think I'm right as an atheist, um, I refuse to let that interfere with my relationships with my family or my friends. And, you know, I'd rather have my friendships and I'd rather have my family than be right. Now, I do draw a line there. I'm not going to give up my atheism to keep my family. I'm not, I, and I wouldn't expect them to break, give up their religion to, to keep me in the family either. But at the same time, 
it's not worth arguing over some days. Some days it's just time to be together, love on each other, hug each other's necks, do all the stuff that we used to, we still do as a family. Um, now, if your family, if you're coming out of an abusive situation, yeah, get away. But abuse is the one exception. But if it's not an abusive relationship, if you have a very, like I have very loving parents, I still contact my mom. My mom's still a very devoted believer. She teaches the Bible study and she plays piano at the church. So it's like, what am I going to do? She's, you know, 82 years old. She's not going to change just because her son has become an atheist. Um, but, you know, I love my mom, okay, and I'm going to continue to love my mom, and I'm going to continue to hug her, and I'm going to continue to be good to her and take care of her because she's my mom. And I think a lot of atheists, you know, they're, you know, sometimes sometimes it is an abusive situation, but other times it's just you got to remember where they're at. They're not where you're at. And going back to, you know, rule two, be patient with others, that especially is important with your family. And in some cases, your fam- you still need the emotional support of your family just to live life. So make sure you have that. Um, number seven, and this is one that's new for me. Sometimes it's important to find a new cause. And I originally thought that I was going to become a teacher in education and educating people was my cause. But I think I'm burned out of that. I was a school board member for a long time. I've been involved in education. I was a Christian education director. And so now there's some things, even when I was a public school teacher, I'm like, eh, gosh, that's a lot like indoctrination, you know, and I'm, I'm chomping at, you know, or you know, growling because I want to say something, but it's like, eh, it's my job. Um, and I just don't think that that's it. I think I educate, but YouTube is more my, my platform. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and then as I worked through my therapist when I got back to Michigan, and the idea of me being autistic came up. I'm like, God, you know, that might be it. Um, so I'm very much a, a person for adult autism awareness because one of the great tragedies, I think, of the passage of time for like me, you know, as a Gen Xer, um, when I was growing up, none of this autism stuff really existed. They were still coming to terms with people, the fact that people were dyslexic and, you know, other you know, challenges that people had. And the autism kind of creeped up in the 90s, and then, you know, everybody yelling about this caused it, that caused it, and everything. And really, it's just, bottom line, it's probably genetic. Um, it, you, some people are just born this way, which is why a certain percentage of people are introverts, and part of that might be autism. It doesn't de- have to be a debilitating thing, but it is makes you look at the world differently. When people ask me what motivates me on this cause is because it makes a lot of sense for me because all my life I have felt like a stranger in a strange land. I have felt like an alien from another planet, like I didn't really belong. Um, And very few people pulled me out of that. And now I'm beginning to realize that probably a lot of my friends that I grew up with, classmates, things like that, they're experiencing the same thing. And now we have a name for it. And I kind of am reminded of the story of my father who discovered he was dyslexic when right before he died. He was like 48, and then so somebody suggested him, you know, I've never been able to read very well. And one son said, well, maybe you're dyslexic. And he looked it up, you know, and we started to talk about it. And sure enough, you know, and it was a really enlightening thing for me because he always hated the fact that he couldn't read very well. You know, he always felt like a dummy. And... You know, and this is what he said to you. I always felt like a dummy head, but it's just my brain and my, you know, my eyes just don't see words the same way everybody else does. And for me, it's kind of the same kind of revelation. Only I have, I have a lot more time to deal with this. And so that I, you know, down the road, I can have a happier life. Um, I suppose in some ways I've lived a better lifestyle than my dad when he did when he was younger and things like that. So I'm on a better path. But... You know, I feel kind of like that that story motivates me to say, you know, it'd be nice if a lot more adults who are struggling with, I just don't fit in, I feel like an alien on a different planet, could get that help. Oh, no, no, man, you're just autistic. And there's ways to overcome this and feel better about yourself and feel better about living life. And so finding a cause can sometimes replace that fervor 
you know, that you used to have with the cause of Christ or Islam or, you know, um, you know, Hinduism, whatever you came out of, okay, um, just finding something where you can benefit people and help people out. For me, it's all about autism awareness and getting adults over the stigma of thinking they're autistic. I remember when my therapist said it, it was like, my first reaction, oh, that can't be true, but it's like, Ed, learn to think about this. It could be true. Uh, so find a cause. Uh, my eighth bonus, for those of you that are in the ministry, contact the Clergy Project. When people ask me where I got my therapist, it was the Clergy Project. Now, they only give you like 12 weeks of free therapy. But my therapist has stuck with me, and she's made it very affordable for me to, to get help. And that's why I don't tell you who her name is, or where she is, because for me, I don't want people just, you know, bugging her about that. But if you are a member of the clergy, if you are a pastor, a minister, a priest, I strongly suggest that you contact the Clergy Project and get in because they will help you get through stuff. Um, and they were just wonderful for me. They, you know, my career counseling was in there too, and they kind of led me onto something and I remember when my career counselor suddenly realized, oh, you're, you're, you're different. You, you've been a something all your life, and now you're trying to figure out something else. And, yeah, you know, it, it helped. Okay, so bonus tip eight for your use in the ministry, contact the Clergy Project. I want to talk uh, a couple of things I want to talk about. Um, one more thing about manipulation because this relates to a comment. I'm going to deal with comments but the comment of the week, and I don't, rem I couldn't find it, and I feel bad about this, but I think it was Jenna, uh, who's been a longtime subscriber um, and follower of mine on, on multiple platforms. Um, she asked me, I think, about the right-left dynamic of politics in the United States. Well, I could talk about that, but I could also talk about how how manipulation works. Okay, manipulation, the way you manipulate somebody is very simple. It's, it's so simple that it's scary at times. But if you can get somebody afraid, if you can get somebody feeling shame, if you can get somebody feeling anger, if you can get somebody uh, basically getting them into an emotional state of where they are very highly emotional and they're not thinking, then you can implant ideas in that emotional state. And because a person's defenses, their rational defenses are down, they will be more likely to accept that. Okay? Using religion as my first example, because a preacher gets up there, and this is how I deconvert it, is when I realized this is what I, the hell I was doing. Okay? I was making people feel guilty about being sinners and making them feel guilty about you know having sin in their life and doing the wrong things and then I was offering them up a cure to a problem they didn't really have because I was implanting the idea at that point when they're feeling ashamed and they're feeling bad you know you know you you've sinned against God and all this stuff and then I'm implanting this idea of you know Salvation is through Jesus Christ. All you do have to do is accept this. I'm offering up a cure. Uh, and I've talked about this before. It's a, Sin is a problem that doesn't actually exist, in the, and we're selling them the cure. And it was that moment that I was realizing, son of a bitch, I'm manipulating people. Because then we take up an offering, and they put their money thanking me for giving this, this relief through Jesus. And I'm using that example because... And, when I talk about the United States political systems and the two-party system, the two-party system is definitely flippin' manipulative in that regard. Okay, if, if you're part of one party or another, they will sit there and talk about how important it is to vote every year. And, you know, stay loyal to the party. Stay loyal to what we're doing. But when you really think about it, we have 360 million people in this country, and really the only two political opinions that the two parties manipulate us towards are these two opinions. I'm starting to see what that is. It's, that's cooperative manipulation. 
Okay, a lot of people think the two parties are polar opposites. I've watched them in political action. And I remember I remember watching the uh, the Mitt Romney Obama debates. And what struck me about those debates is how many times they agreed with each other. And I would listen to where they agreed and disagree. Okay, sitting there rationally and disagreeing. But what they're, you know, there's a lot of times that the parties, when it, it comes to this manipulation thing, they're trying to keep you in one camp or the other. Uh, and it's really a false dichotomy because there's a whole spectrum of political viewpoints and social viewpoints. And they're trying to get you to fall in one or two camps to get votes. And that's why, you know, and the media does it too, because the media... The media has to sell advertisement space, and so they try to pull you in emotionally. See, this is why you need to understand that having, you know, studying a little bit of social psychology and things like that, I began to realize that, you know, preachers, politicians, and, you know, front people for media outlets, all those guys are trying to pull you in using the exact same tactics. They're trying to get your emotional state worked up so you're not really as rational in thinking about what they're saying. And once they got your emotions engaged, they implant the idea. And you're more likely to accept that planted idea because your emotions are all ginned up. It's why the religious right does guilt. It's why the woke crowd does shame. Okay, I, I don't play favorites. Sorry, I don't. Um, I dislike the tactics of both those groups. And one of them is on the right and one of them is on the left. And nobody knows how to have a rational discussion anymore because media, everything, doesn't want you to have a rational discussion. Because if you had a rational discussion, you might actually come up with a solution. And politicians don't need solutions. They just need votes so they get another term. Okay? Religious figures don't need, you know, solutions. They want to continue to sell you the fact that you have a problem and you're going to have to keep coming back week after week to get the solution to that problem and throw your money in the basket and make money. Politicians want you to keep paying your taxes because that way they keep their money because they got to solve your problems. There's always a problem. You know, there can't ever be an end to a problem if you're a politician. The media needs to sell those ads and make money so they keep everybody employed. So they sell the sensationalism. They, sensationalism is, is set inherently emotional. And all this is manipulative. I'm sorry. It, when my lights went on after I left my faith, I was engaged in working on a political science degree, and I began to notice a lot of parallels between religion and politics. And then I took a class in the media, and I realized, holy crap, the media does the same flipping thing. Nobody wants you to think. Everybody wants you to get emotional. And don't say, well, my side doesn't do that bullshit. They all do it. They all do it. Okay, because the moment you start to think about an issue and start to build evidence and facts and try to be a little bit more objective, that's not where they want you. Okay, they want you in a place where they can implant that emotional idea. And so, uh, Jenna... The two-party system, in my opinion, is A, inherently manipulative, and B, um, kind of a false dichotomy, because um, nobody really falls all right or all left, okay? None of us are all religious right, and none of us are all woke left. Um, none of us are that kind of level of ideological fascism, most of us, where we think everybody else should think like us, but that's where they want you emotionally. Everybody needs to be us. And, you know, I just look at it now and it's like, it's a game. And it's a game of trying to gin up people's emotions so they don't think. And then you get them to act a certain way. It's all about taking advantage of creating basically mobs and then taking advantage of the mob. Okay. And making the mob work for you. Um, and so you got to watch it. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I, maybe some people will disagree with me, but I don't see anything different between the tactics of the media, the politicians, or the religious figures. And it doesn't matter what, where they're on the spectrum or any of that. It, they all use it. They all do it. Because they know if they can engage your emotions. And one last example. I know from preaching, um, when people would compliment me on my sermons, if I had like a real cerebral educational sermon, 
okay, where I'm educating on the passions of the Bible, there would be maybe one or two people say, great sermon, Pastor, it really makes me think. If I did a real emotional, pull at the heartstring, get people upset, uh, get people ashamed sermon, and get done, I get, everybody would shake my hand. Now, that's anecdotal evidence, but I bet if somebody studied that, you'd get the same results. That emotionalism gets people more involved, it brings people in, and it's easier to implant those ideas. And that happens everywhere. It's why when I read Stoic philosophy for the first time, I'm like, this is, this is what, what nobody wants you to know. Okay, um, you know, if you're offended, you're easily manipulated. If you're shamed, you're easily manipulated. If you're angry, you're easily manipulated. In those moments, you're not thinking rationally, and people will implant ideas in your head for their own nefarious purposes. They may have good intentions, but you know, you're not being yourself at that moment because you're not being rational. Uh, a couple other comments to deal with, and I'm going to have to sign off. I don't want to go too long here, but um, I've already hit the half hour mark. But um, I had a comment about Islam. What do you think about Islam? Uh, I think the origin story is about the most batshit crazy thing I've ever heard. Literally, a guy goes into a cave. He, quote unquote, can't read and write, although he demonstrated that he could read and write later. Um, but he gets a book, you know, from some place, some angel, and it comes out. No witnesses, no witnesses to this, by the way. And somehow I'm supposed to accept that. That's got to be the most nuts story I ever thought, heard origin religion story. We're just going to believe a guy because he says so. We didn't see it ourselves, but we're just going to believe it. And I've read the Quran a couple of times, okay? I'm going to tell you, the first impression I ever got of the Quran was that it was written by a committee. And then I found out what the origin story of the Quran was, and indeed, it's written by a committee. Um, <laughs> so that makes it make a lot of sense. Uh, a couple other comments. Um, I got a weird one. Uh, somebody commented on my, you know, go see a dentist. And it's like, uh, yeah, you know, I'm... I've had, I have crooked teeth. My parents were poor. Um, something I embrace. Uh, if you don't like my teeth, don't watch. Uh, you know, don't go away bad. Go away, but don't go away mad or upset about my teeth. Just go away. Um, well, there's a couple others, but you know, they escaped me now, so they couldn't have been that important. Um, but you know, if you want my your comment noticed, you know, probably being insulting is just not a good way to do it. Um, you know, I, I can put that on there. But so I think that's it for today's uh, Sunday with the Rabbit Atheist. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've enjoyed something. And hey, it's better than going to church. So um, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate every one of you. Um, like the video, dislike it, uh, share it with your friends. Uh, but most importantly, subscribe, get notified, and comment below. I'm always interested in your comments. Thank you very much for stopping by. I appreciate every single one of you. And, uh, you know, you have a great day. Have a great Sunday off. You know, actually enjoy whatever you're doing today, whether it's resting or working. And I'll see you next time.